Hidden away in the corner of AMD's product stack is one of the most compelling gaming CPUs of the generation. As of right now, you can't buy the Ryzen 5 7500F through normal retail channels. Only those with the sacred knowledge may acquire one through back alley deals and dark covenants. In exchange for one human soul, or about 150 quid on AliExpress, the 7500F offers essentially all of the performance of the more expensive 7600 and 7600X, with 6 Zen 4 cores on a single CCD and a whopping 32 megabytes of L3 cache. But surely this much performance for such a relatively low price comes at a heavy cost elsewhere? Surely there's some crippling fatal flaw that makes it hard to recommend? Well, no. Almost everything about the new Ryzen 7000 series has been expensive, from new motherboards to DDR5 RAM, and while the previous platform's surprisingly long life should inspire confidence in the future for this new one, the success of its predecessor could prove to be a problem for AMD. What they needed was a compelling entry point to the new platform that would get enthusiasts and gamers on board, and that's where the Ryzen 5 7500F comes in. With an MSRP of 179 US dollars, it undercuts the almost identically spec 7600 by $50, simply by offering a 100 MHz lower clock speed and by omitting the integrated graphics cores. Unfortunately, so far it's been mainly reserved for OEM systems and the Chinese market, which is a touch frustrating. However, there's plenty of stock on sites like AliExpress at the time of writing, so you shouldn't have to rely on scalpers from eBay. I picked mine up as a singles day deal for £142, including import fees, and at the time of writing it still appears to be available for under £150, or about £20 less than the 7600 on the same sites. Which raises a question for regular viewers, why am I reviewing it? I generally look at two types of product, potential used bargains or former flagships that have been made nearly obsolete. The 7500F doesn't really fit into those categories. Well, here at Iceberg Tech I maintain one fixed spec rig for the purpose of testing older GPUs, which I call the moderately priced gaming PC. The idea of the MPG PC is a basic setup that can be had for between five and six hundred pounds, and the last two iterations have featured Zen 3 CPUs. The first used a Ryzen 5 5600G, which was recommended by a lot of YouTubers during the GPU shortages, and which I thought many people might want to be upgrading from at the time. Then I switched up to the Ryzen 5600X for the second generation, due to the new budget GPUs being limited to four or eight lanes of PCIe bandwidth. With. Although I rarely recommend the 5600G anymore, the Ryzen 5 5600 and 5600X remain my personal go-to recommendations for anyone building a gaming PC on a budget throughout 2023. So why change now? Well, honestly, it's partly an excuse to buy a shiny new toy, but I have plenty more genuine reasons. Firstly, I plan to do some DDR5 testing in the near future, and this is about the cheapest way of doing so. Secondly, I want to review more powerful graphics cards this year, as prices drop on Ampere and RDNA 2, and I don't want to risk them being bottlenecked by the CPU. The moderately priced gaming PC has to move with the times. The new MPG PC for 2024 will therefore consist of the 7500F installed on an MSI B650 Gaming Plus Wi-Fi motherboard, paired with 32 gigs of Corsair Vengeance DDR5 6000 CL30 RAM, cooled under a shockingly effective Thermalrite Frost Spirit 140 dual tower CPU cooler, and powered by an EVGA 750W GQ PSU. In the spirit of thoroughness, in this review I'll be testing at stock settings as well as making a few tweaks to the power limit, PBO settings and tuning the RAM to see exactly how far we can take it. Valorant is my go-to title for big numbers in CPU reviews. Zen 3 could manage 500 plus easily, and Zen 4 carries on the trend. In fact, though it was initially somewhat disappointing. As I can't ever guarantee which maps I'm going to be testing in Valorant, I take an average of the frames from three deathmatches. 
which in this case came to just 518 FPS at stock settings, pretty much even with the 5600X on average, and a little worse at 1% lows. The increased clocks and tuned memory worked a treat though, averages climbed over 20% to 641, and 1% lows gained almost 100 FPS. I can be a little more precise with Fortnite thanks to its replay function, however this is a different season from a lot of my other CPU benchmarks, so I'm not sure how fair it is to compare them. The only other CPU I've tested so far was the i9-9900K, which the 7500F beats by 15% at stock settings and over 30% when overclocked. Counter-Strike 2 lets me pick the same map each time, and hasn't made any major changes in the last few months, so I'm pretty confident that these numbers can be safely compared to the other CPUs I've tested lately. The 7500F disappoints a little, at least at stock settings, it falls a fraction below the 5600X at 308 FPS on average. Overclocking helps a bunch though, bringing that average up over 18% to 365 and having a similarly big effect on the 1% lows. Warzone is the first of several titles that starts to show a weakness in my test setup. The RX 6900 XT is actually holding back performance. I test this title at 1440p basic, for personal reasons, I prefer to play at a resolution where I can see exactly who's shooting at me. For the most part this hasn't been a problem in the past, but the 7500F is proving to be a huge jump over everything else I've tested here. At stock settings it manages 198 FPS, some 40 frames higher than the next nearest CPU. Overclocking adds virtually nothing to the average, but 1% and 0.1% lows climb significantly. Maybe FSR or some other upscaling would expose a bigger difference, but honestly it's kind of academic. The point is, the 7500F could happily drive some of the most powerful GPUs available in 2024 here. My Starfield test is, as always, a walk through New Atlantis. This is one of the most CPU demanding areas of the game, and is not at all representative of performance in combat or space exploration. Nevertheless, it's an area you have to visit pretty often. At 1080 medium, the GPU occasionally holds back the 7500F, delivering 84 FPS stock and 90 overclocked. Dropping to 720 low broadens the gap a little, with stock settings increasing to 89 FPS and 99 when overclocked. Uh, for some reason I can't make my usual cyberpunk benchmark run without being attacked by Arasaka security forces. I might have to make a new save or something. Anyway, I did eventually manage to get complete benchmarks for both RT and non-RT runs. At 1080 medium, the stock run hits almost 130 FPS, exceeding the previous 6 core and even passing the 8 core 5700X. Overclocking improves things even further, especially in the 1% lows. With Ultra RT enabled, things get a little more GPU bound, so I dropped from FSR Performance to FSR Ultra Performance. This means two things, one that you probably shouldn't compare this result to the 5700X or even the 5600X, and two it achieved almost 74 FPS at stock settings and over 80 FPS overclocked. The Last of Us is, again, completely GPU bound at 1080 high. The stock run hits 118 FPS, while the overclocked run actually falls away below that for reasons I can't quite fathom. As I haven't got an RTX 4090 to hand, the best I could do to show the real potential of the 7500F was to drop to the low quality preset and turn on performance FSR. This saw the stock result climb to 150 FPS and the overclock now actually shows a significant gain too, averages climb by 13% to 170. For the final time in this video, the RX 6900 XT is holding back the 7500F in Jedi Survivor. 
At least, this is true for the beginning of the test run before I arrive in the town centre. The average FPS at 1080p medium is 123 at stock and 137 overclocked, beating both of the Zen 3 parts by a small margin. Although I'm not convinced FSR does anything for performance in this instance, I used it anyway and dropped quality to low, which saw a sub 10% gain at both stock settings and overclocked. Microsoft Flight Sim isn't maxing out the CPU or the GPU at 1440 high. In fact, I'm not sure exactly what is holding it back, but boosting the clock speed and tightening memory timings clearly has an impact. The 78 FPS achieved at stock is scarcely an improvement over the 5600X or 5700X, but the overclocked result sees a healthy 11 frame gain on average. Finally, we have a record breaker in Civ 6. At stock, the 7500F falls a few hundredths of a second behind the 5700X in the AI benchmark, but overclocked it gains over one third of a second. Average turn time improves from 6.14 to 5.75 seconds. Onto productivity, and the 7500F punches above its weight in DaVinci Resolve. The H.264 render test on a 5 minute 4K video completes in 12 minutes 55 at stock, over 3 minutes faster than its predecessor. Overclocking shaves over a minute off this time, leaving it second only to the 8 core Ryzen 7 7840HX, a mobile Zen 4 CPU which is being held back somewhat by its thermal and power limits. The 7500F is even more impressive in the Blender Classroom test. At stock it finished in 6 minutes 20, only a few seconds behind the Ryzen 7 5700X. Overclocking drops the render time to 5 minutes 52, less than a quarter of a second behind the 7840HX. As I haven't tested the Ryzen 5 7600 or 7600X, I'm sort of taking it on faith that there's no real difference between a 7500F and those more expensive CPUs. There's no practical reason why these single CCD Zen 4 chips, clocked to within 50 MHz, shouldn't perform basically identically. In fact, if rumours are true, some 7600Xs have been spotted with two CCDs, which should actually introduce some latency. I don't know if this is also true for the 7500F, only that I can confirm mine has just the one. With all this power at such a significant reduction in price, surely there are sacrifices. Well, no, apparently not. As we've seen, the clock speed difference can be easily overcome simply by playing with the PBO limits. The F in the model number signifies the absence of integrated graphics, which as far as I can tell accounts for pretty much all of the price difference between this and the 7600, and at least by reputation, the missing iGPU isn't one that's worth giving an F about anyway. Despite being based on the RDNA architecture, the 7600 and 7600X's graphics have only two compute units and, according to Guru3D, fall behind not only the old Vega graphics in the earlier APUs, but even behind modern Intel iGPUs. As the GPUs integrated into the rest of the Zen 4 lineup don't have an equivalent to QuickSync for video editors, the only real reason to own it is as an emergency backup should your graphics card fail. And while that is a valid concern, it's nothing that a GT710 can't cover. Is it worth going through AliExpress or other unofficial retail channels to pick up one of these bargain Zen 4s? Well, maybe. The more common alternatives have so far yet to drop below £190 on the local market, so to get the same performance for a 20% discount is not a bad deal at all. 
However, you're potentially sacrificing your warranty, enduring a long wait for delivery, as well as putting your faith in a retailer with a less than stellar reputation to make that £40 saving. And while £40 or $50 is a lot to save off a single component, in the context of a whole platform, one with relatively expensive motherboards and RAM, as well as the presumably quite potent GPU you intend to pair with it, 40 quid's kind of a drop in the bucket. The 7500F is no doubt an absolute steal on the 2024 CPU market, and I'm very impressed with how well it performs. But depending on how committed you are to saving money, it might just be inconvenient enough to buy one, then it makes the 7600 look like a more palatable choice. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.